Hello, you're watching Dukascopy TV, and I'm Ben Jones bringing you this Friday's weekly wrap up. Joining me on the line to discuss the key events of the week is Frederick Ducrezé from Credit Agricole. Now to begin with, on Monday we saw UK PMI data rising to be the highest in 17 years, which then rocketed the GBP Japanese yen pair to nearly a two week high. What can we take from this data and how do you see the sterling faring in the near future? Well, there's absolutely no doubt that the recent strike of UK data has been very strong and actually much stronger than consensus. And this comes after uh, a very strong uh, series of hard data, namely GDP growth in the second and, and third quarter. So the UK at the minimum is on a, a, a stronger foot uh, to, towards a recovery for next year. This uh, seems also to be the main reason why the Bank of England has uh, stopped or refrained from uh, adding to its uh, monetary stimulus in recent times. This means, uh, well, that, as you said, the GBP sterling uh, pairs have been uh, sustained as well. It might be unsustainable to some extent in the very near term, but unless the BOE does change something in its monetary framework, in its forward guidance framework in particular, I think that upward pressure on the currency will remain. Moving on to Wednesday, we saw that the growth slipped last month for the Eurozone PMI, despite a lot of strength in Germany's manufacturing sector. Can you discuss why you think the desired growth in the euro is not there? And is this highlighting the uneven nature of the single European currency? We would love to have a much stronger growth in the Eurozone at the moment. Everyone would. But uh, the fact is there is a lot uh, of uh, headwinds remaining at the moment in terms of fiscal drag, in terms of ongoing private sector deleveraging as well. The fact also that the divergence uh, between countries remains significant is in itself uh, an obstacle to growth. But that being said, I think that uh, if you look at the PMI over the last five to six months, there has been a very strong catch-up. Uh, from low levels and the momentum in my view remains positive moving into next year bearing a shock obviously it also means that um, the divergence you get the uh, slow and subdued pace of recovery in the periphery in particular is the result of the structural adjustment we get so that's what uh, the ECB told us this week once again there is no such surprise to see a subdued pace of recovery in those countries that experienced a massive adjustment in their public and private sectors in recent years. Now, the main story of the week that really shook up the markets was the ECB's surprise decision yesterday to cut their interest rates. It's been discussed that Mario Draghi was the key driving force behind this decision. Why do you think he wanted this to happen and how do you see it affecting the currency in the future? Well, for a start, I think the currency is uh, only part of the story. Uh, we, as observers, ECB watchers, uh, did a mistake in underestimating the ECB's uh, willingness and resolve to fight deflation risk. I think that's the base, uh, the, the main story at the moment, the main justification for the early delivery of this rate cut this week. We underestimated Draghi's resolve, that's for sure, but also the whole forward guidance framework, uh, which the ECB implemented during the summer this year. And within this framework, the rate cut, the extension uh, of the full allotment liquidity regime will help to uh, enhance the message that rates will uh, main, be maintained at low levels for a long period. So that's clearly the key message. It's a, a matter of timing. Uh, we got surprised uh, one month earlier, maybe. But it's also a matter of the uh, medium-term strategy in terms of monetary policy in the Eurozone. There might be more to come. In terms of the currency, that means that uh, uh, maybe the threat of uh, further rate cuts, including in the deposit rate, will keep indeed a downward pressure on the euro moving forward. The only thing I would add is that obviously it also depends on the US, what happens with the Fed, what happens with the budget, what happens with US growth. You need to have a combination of uh, stronger growth in the US and a tapering that happens at some point early next year by the Fed to get the euro dollar much uh, lower. And finally, looking into next week, what do you see as the key event for people to keep an eye on? 
I would guess that the focus will remain very much on the on Europe because uh, the data in the U.S. is rather of second tier nature, and Europe will get GDP in the third quarter. We will have likely a slowdown from the second quarter, but still positive growth overall. So that's not bad news in itself. More importantly, I think uh, we get the confirmation, final reading of HICP inflation in the eurozone in October, which was this uh, shocking uh, 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 reason why the ECB eased this week. Uh, if we get some modest upward revision in the final figures, that could be a trigger for some uh, uh, reversal in the currency as well, um, slightly higher. Last but not least, we have the ECB's survey of professional forecaster next week, which is something the, ma- the, the market usually doesn't look at too closely. But in that case, we will uh, look uh, very closely this time to inflation expectations within this survey by the ECB. There might be a risk that uh, on some measures, inflation expectations over the medium term start to drift lower. And this will be a reason for the ECB to remain very dovish in the very near term. Well, it certainly has been an interesting week for the Eurozone and possibly another one to come. That is all for today's weekly wrap-up. Thank you for joining me, Frederick. Make sure you tune in next week for more updates and exclusive interviews. But for now, goodbye.